Hello everyone, I am the Magic Kirby and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. This episode of The Brewery marks the season finale of this first season. Before going further with the episode, I would like a moment to thank everyone who has in some way, shape or form helped this channel grow to where it is now as well as say a few words. I started the channel literally three months ago and I had no idea it would be where it is now. For quite some time I've been wanting to start a YouTube channel where I could showcase ideas on brews and death techs. That soon evolved into being able to upload gameplay videos with some buds as well as a third series I hadn't even considered before, A Flight, which is where I discuss the new cards from the latest set or product from a commander player's perspective. The support from the viewers has been much appreciated. One of the things I love about the commander format is the community. Being able to share ideas and learn from each other as well as inspiring each other is, I feel, one of the reasons why the Commander format is as popular as it is. Looking back on this first season, it's evident that viewers have inspired me as a brewer with their requests for deck text. In fact, one of the biggest videos so far on my channel was requested by a viewer, Sepper Aga, hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, to whom I was able to fulfill another request. Sepper Aga hasn't been the only one either. I was able to fulfill other requests from viewers such as these. Even this deck tech was suggested in part by a viewer. I've also been fortunate enough to have a couple of patrons support me on Patreon and I've been able to make some videos based on their requests as well as provide them early access to some videos, including this one which they had a chance to watch a day earlier. While I'm at it, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my patrons as well. I also want to give a shout out to a couple of viewers for commenting on most of my videos like Guardbreak, Crovax13 and Fat Pikachu 26 if there's anyone I've missed, please forgive me, it's been a really long week. Anyways, back to your regularly scheduled programming. On this episode, I will be discussing a classic commander, Atraxa Praetor's Voice. Atraxa is a 4-4 angel horror with flying, vigilance, death touch, and lifelink for 1 green, 1 white, 1 blue, and 1 black. She also has, at the beginning of your end step, proliferate. Atraxa is currently ranked number 1 on EDH rec, so she's a stranger to no one playing commander. Her abilities allow her to be at the helm of so many different decks from every kind of possible combination of counter hijinks to even angel tribal. Although jaded to no end, this is a planeswalker focused build. When Atraxa was first spoiled for Commander 2016, I immediately thought of building a planeswalker deck around her as a place to put most of my planeswalker cards in. Since then, I have heavily tinkered with the deck on Cockatrice. Planeswalkers are the most popular card type and their price is usually exceedingly high until they rotate out of standard or increase if they're useful in modern or other eternal formats. Looking at you, Renin6. So I do extensive testing before purchasing any Chase Planeswalker. However, before going into detail on the Planeswalkers, all of which comprise 25% of my deck, I will begin by discussing all of the support cards for the deck and then I will explain the logic behind including these particular Planeswalkers. I want to take this opportunity to put out a bit of a disclaimer. This deck tech is by no means meant to be an authoritative or absolute way to run a Traxa or even a Super Friends a Traxa deck. This is more of an exposition of my personal brew. It's a video explaining what I use, how to use it, and why I have it. Hopefully it can give others ideas of their own when assembling a Traxa Super Friends. Maybe it can show people what's included in my deck when you see me play it with an episode of the stage, similar to my other brewery videos of decks used in other episodes of the stage. But again, in no way is this video meant to broadcast and optimize Atraxa Super Friends. Let's begin with the commander. The point of running Planeswalkers with Atraxa is because she proliferates at the beginning of our end step. However, Atraxa shouldn't be the only search for incrementing loyalty counters. My deck runs Sword of Truth and Justice, Karn's Bastion, Evolution Sage, and Flux Channeler. These four cards, similarly to Atraxa, have the proliferate mechanic on them. Whenever the creature Sword of Truth and Justice is attached to deals combat damage to a player, we proliferate. Karn's Bastion can proliferate at instant speed whenever you pay 4 generic mana and tap it. Evolution Sage proliferates with a landfall trigger, and Flux Channeler proliferates whenever we cast a non-creature spell. Since the deck runs all 11 fetch lands, it's possible to trigger Evolution Sage twice in a single turn. That's nothing to scoff at, especially when one or two additional loyalty counters can make the difference from activating a Planeswalker's ultimate. Flux Channeler is also another great way to proliferate counters in the deck since there are 47 non-creature spells in the deck. 
Basically, casting a Planeswalker will proliferate the loyalty counters of those already on the battlefield. Proliferate isn't the only way to increase loyalty counters either. Deep Glow Skate will double the counters on any amount of permanence we control. This fish is very similar to Doubling Season, which is also included in the deck. With Doubling Season in play, any Planeswalker entering the battlefield enters with twice the amount of starting loyalty. Additionally, Doubling Season also works with Proliferate. Whenever you proliferate with Doubling Season in play, you're essentially proliferating twice. Keep in mind that Doubling Season also doubles the amount of plus one plus one counters on our creatures. So any effect that places plus one plus one counters on our creatures is essentially doubled. Not only that, but Doubling Season also helps protect Planeswalkers since it could double the amount of tokens that they can create, thus providing even more trump blockers for their protection. But I'll get into that in greater detail later on. If there were ever a staple in a Super Friends deck, Doubling Season is definitely it. Pure Imaginative Rascal is also included for its unique ability with counters. Unlike Doubling Season, Perk can increase the loyalty counters of Planeswalkers when they activate a positive ability. For example, if I uptick a Planeswalker, Perk places an additional one loyalty counter on him or her. Another way I take advantage of Atraxa is with Audric Lunar Marshal. Most of the Planeswalkers in the deck create creature tokens to protect themselves. With Atraxa and Audric in play, all those tokens, as well as the other creatures we control, gain Flying, Death Touch, Life Link, and Vigilance. That means that we can attack with total abandon, as well as keep them around to defend my Planeswalkers. On the topic of protecting my Planeswalkers, let's see what other methods I employ to that end. Silent Arbiter and Dueling Grounds are a must. These permanents make it so no one can attack or block with more than a single creature. This shuts down swarm strategies as well as ensuring that only one attacker can come our way, an attacker that Atraxa can very easily deal with, or any expendable creature for that matter. However, it doesn't have to be an expendable creature or token. My deck also runs Fogbank and Guard Gomazoa. Sure, they die to non-combat damage and removal, but if they can successfully block a creature, that's one less creature hitting our Planeswalkers. And when only a single attacker can come my way, they're ideal blockers. But what if that creature has evasion or trample? Well, no problem. My deck's also running Maze of Ith and Core Haven. The maze doesn't require mana to activate, but it can't be tapped for mana. The Haven might require two mana to activate, but at least it can provide one generic mana when tapped for mana. Another land that opponents forget about in the heat of the moment is Mobilized District. With enough Planeswalkers out, it costs zero to activate and you get a chump blocker seemingly out of nowhere. But even if opponents are able to send everything our way, we're still covered by cards like Spike Weaver. By paying one and removing a plus one plus one counter from it, it prevents all combat damage until end of turn. A counter that isn't a problem removing since there's so many ways to proliferate in the deck as well as adding plus one plus one counters to creatures. Or maybe we want a creature to attack us. Sometimes the best deterrent against attacks is having Academy Rector or Arena Rector available for blocking. When Arena Rector dies, we can cheat a Planeswalker onto the battlefield straight from my library. Opponents become wary when seeing this card on the battlefield against a Super Friends deck. So that alone might have them not attack us unless they are able to get around it. So in any case, it also buys us time and turns. When Academy Rector dies, we can cheat an enchantment into play. The enchantment I usually go for is Doubling Season, but depending on the situation, I can just as easily look for Dueling Grounds or even Oath of Teferi. Now that I mentioned Oath of Teferi, I include other cards that boost Planeswalkers. Oath of Teferi is amazing since it has a delayed blink effect when it enters the battlefield. This is great in this deck since most of the creatures have an enter the battlefield trigger, but also because it can reset a Planeswalker with a really low loyalty count. Its static ability allows us to activate the loyalty abilities of our Planeswalkers twice each turn. That's just absurdly busted in this deck. On its own, it's a way to increase the loyalty of walkers. But when walkers have abilities that can create tokens or deal with creatures on the board, then this enchantment allows our planeswalkers to more efficiently protect themselves. But that's something I'll get into detail a little bit later on. Rings of Brighthearth is another great card that allows us to essentially double a planeswalker's activated ability. However, it doesn't just duplicate the activated abilities of planeswalkers, we can also use it to duplicate Maze of Ith, the Chain Veil, etc. Speaking of, the Chain Veil is another busted card in the deck. Obviously, this card is designed for Planeswalkers. When you pay 4 and tap it, you can activate your Planeswalkers a second time that turn. This effect is similar to Oath of Teferi, but can be activated multiple times if you're able to untap it. 
Another card I'm running to double the activation of Planeswalkers is Brago King Eternal. Brago is a great card in the deck since it can reset Planeswalkers that have loyalty counters on them less than their starting loyalty. Also, if you blink them, you can activate them a second time that turn. Not only that, but Brago can also re-trigger Enter the Battlefield abilities from cards that have them like the previously mentioned Deep Glow Skate and the soon to be discussed Yamavaya Dryad and Wood Elves. The previously mentioned Yamavaya Dryad and Wood Elves are amazing in the deck for various reasons. They provide much needed land ramp but also provide a body to chum block and take a bullet for our planeswalkers. Since they're creatures, that means they can also be blinked or bounced in order to recycle them and be able to ramp for even more lands. Sure, they're restricted to ramping for forests, but it doesn't have to be basic forests. My deck's running 8 forests, so they'll definitely have something to ramp for. The other ramp spells in the deck are cheap in order to get those lands on the battlefield as quickly as possible. Farseek and Nature's Lore achieve just that. The deck also runs two mana rocks, Mana Crypt and Honor Worn Shaku. Mana Crypt is pretty much useless when casting Atraxa unless she gets commander taxed. But Honor Worn Shaku basically makes all of our Planeswalkers tap for one colorless mana. So although it costs 3 to cast, it more than makes up for it by making our Planeswalkers even more useful than they already are. On the topic of making Planeswalkers useful, Reki, the history of Kamigawa, makes each Planeswalker a cantrip since their legendary permanence. Reki doesn't just work with Planeswalkers either. The deck also has other legendary cards such as creatures, artifacts, enchantments, and sorceries, one of those being Primeval's Glorious Rebirth. This card is just one of the many ways to protect or recover our Planeswalkers. As previously mentioned, Planeswalkers now have the legendary super type. That means that if my graveyard is full of fallen super friends, this spell can cheat them all back into play. Ideally, I obviously want to avoid that altogether since I want to prevent creatures from attacking my planeswalkers, but maybe they were in the graveyard because I activated their ultimate. Then Primeval's Glorious Rebirth can also technically function as a way to reset those planeswalkers. On the topic of protecting planeswalkers, I know I've mentioned chump blocking, preventing combat damage, and getting rid of creatures. However, if the entire pod is against us, it might not be enough. That's why I'm running as many choice Void Wipes as I can. The deck runs Austere Command, Supreme Verdict, Wrath of God, Toxic Deluge, Terminus, Time Wipe, Evacuation, and Cyclonic Rift. Supreme Verdict gets past Counter Spells. Wrath of God gets past Regeneration. Toxic Deluge, Terminus, and Evacuation get past Indestructible. Time Wipe can protect a Traxa while destroying every other creature. Austere Command can either get rid of all creatures or a combination of some creatures and artifacts and or enchantments, while Cyclonic Rift, the largest salt inducer of them all, gets rid of anything that is in a land. It's worth mentioning that my brood does run two tutors, Vampiric Tutor and Demonic Tutor. These are just catch-alls in case I need to look through the deck for any answers or for a particular piece of a combo that could be assembled. On that note, I'm also running Sylvan Library because Atraxa can help me recover any life in case I have to draw into more than one card off of it and, worst case scenario, I can at least rearrange the leftover two cards of my library after drawing for turn. Alright, now to the meat of the deck. As I mentioned before, the deck runs 25 Planeswalkers. That might seem excessive even for a Super Friends build, but I wanted to see how many Planeswalkers I could fit in the deck without having it collapse under the weight of them all. Since each planeswalker can fulfill different needs for the deck, I will discuss each one in detail. As I do, I will update a checklist where you can see exactly how each one functions within the entirety of the deck. For example, which planeswalkers create tokens to help defend themselves, or which ones can deal with creatures whether by bouncing them, destroying them, blinking them, exiling them, changing their power, etc. Or which ones can draw us cards or provide some form of advantage, etc. Since this makes it practically impossible to classify them under a single category, I'm going to go through them in alphabetical order and, as I mentioned earlier, check off in what different roles or categories they would fit within the grander design of the deck. A Jani Steadfast costs 3 generic and 1 white to cast, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 4 which is good for his casting cost. His plus 1 is useful in the deck since Atraxa lacks first strike. Sure, she already has vigilance and lifelink but a Jani giving her first strike means that her death touch is even more brutal since she hits first, unless of course the blocker has double strike or first strike of its own. She also gets plus one plus one which means more life for us and more damage to opponents. 
What's great about this first ability is when Audric Lunark Marshall is out. That means that although Ajani is giving these boons to a single creature, Audric spreads that love to all of our other creatures. Ajani's second ability is amazing in this deck. Giving a plus one plus one counter to all our creatures is epic with all the ways to proliferate in the deck. Also, Ajani is giving a loyalty counter to all our planeswalkers. Sometimes that extra loyalty counter is the difference between getting an emblem or not. Speaking of emblems, Ajani's ultimate is an emblem that says, if a source would deal damage to you or a planeswalker you control, prevent all but one of that damage. This emblem is nuts since it protects planeswalkers from huge damage. It might not protect against swarms, but that's what the support cards in the deck are for. It's important to note that with doubling season in play, you can obtain Ajani's emblem the same turn he enters the battlefield. Aminatu the Fate Shifter costs 1 white, 1 blue, and 1 black, has 3 abilities we can use, and a starting loyalty of 3, which is good for her casting cost. Her plus 1 is a watered down brainstorm, but not every planeswalker can be Jace the Mind Sculptor. Either way, I'm still able to draw a card and return something that isn't so pressing. If we need to shuffle it away, we can use one of the 11 fetch lands in the deck. Her minus 1 is a blink ability for any permanent we control. That can be used to redo any enter the battlefield effects, reuse a land, or even blink a planeswalker to reset them and use them again. Her last two abilities are the only ones we're not using in the deck. Her final activated ability we probably won't ever use because our goal is to have the superior board state. That being said, although I've never had to activate it myself, sometimes a situation may occur when the grass is greener and we want what's on the other side. Since I've yet to use this ability, I feel that Aminatu is one of the more inefficient planeswalkers I have in the deck up to date. So if any new planeswalker is released with a similar function for the deck but with better abilities, then I'm definitely swapping them in for Aminatu. Ashok Dream Render costs 1 generic and 2 hybrid blue-black, has 2 abilities and a starting loyalty of 5 which is outstanding for its casting cost. However, the reason for this is because Ashok has no inherent way to increase its loyalty. This isn't a problem in this deck though due to all the proliferation. Its static ability is brutal in multiplayer games if we get it out early enough since it prevents opponents from searching their libraries. That means that their fetch lands, ramp spells, and tutors are useless. Its minus one ability mills the top four cards of a player's library, but then each opponent exiles their graveyard. So while this is ability isn't going to necessarily procure a win via mill, it does disrupt opponents and definitely puts a damper on graveyard strategies. In essence, Ashok is used to stop combo decks from finding their pieces and stop graveyard decks from functioning. Elspeth Knight Errant costs 2 generic and 2 white, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 4, which is good for her casting cost. Elspeth's first ability creates a 1-1 white soldier token, which can be used to protect her. Her second plus 1 ability gives plus 3 plus 3 and flying to a creature until end of turn. Although Atraxa already has flying, giving her plus 3 plus 3 is nothing to scoff at since it makes Atraxa into a 3 turn clock. Her ultimate is perhaps one of the best possible emblems to acquire in the game since it makes all of our artifacts, creatures, enchantments, and lands indestructible. Keep in mind that this doesn't protect against bouncing, exiling, or negative toughness, but it still deals with a lot of things. It also protects our board state when we have to cast board wipes of our own. It's important to note that with doubling season in play, you can obtain Elspeth's emblem the same term she enters the battlefield, although she'll be sacrificed as a state bait action afterwards. But it's definitely worth it. Freyalee's Lanowar's Fury costs 3 generic and 2 green, has 3 abilities we can use, and a starting loyalty of 3, which isn't good considering her casting cost, but her plus 2 creates a 1-1 green elf druid token which can tap for green mana. So she essentially creates a Lanowar Elf by gaining two loyalty counters. These tokens can also obviously be used to protect Freyalis as a chum blocker. She can also naturalize an artifact or enchantment with her minus two ability. Although it'd be overcosted to use that ability the moment she's cast, it's still a relevant ability to have. Destroying an opponent's mana rock when there's no other target is a good way to set them back. Likewise, it can be used to get rid of any menacing artifact or enchantment on the battlefield. Her ultimate isn't an emblem, but for 6 loyalty we can draw a card for each green creature we control. That might not seem so grand considering this is a 4 colored deck. However, she creates green creature tokens, Atraxa is green, the ramp creatures are green, Reki and Pur are green, as well as Spike Weaver and Evolution Sage. 
Besides, Freelys isn't the only planeswalker in the deck that creates green creature tokens. Jace, Unraveler of Secrets, costs 3 generic and 2 blue to cast, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 5, which is good for his casting cost. His plus 1 allows us to scry 1 before we draw 1, which is way better than simply drawing a card. His minus 2 can bounce a creature. This can be useful for tempo gain against an opponent's creature, but can also be used to bounce our own Deep Glow Skate or other Enter the Battlefield effect creature in order to reuse them. It can also be used to bounce a key creature to our hand to protect it before casting a board wipe. His ultimate grants us a pretty oppressive emblem that counters an opponent's first spell each turn. That's not just limited to their own turn either. If an opponent were to cast anything during anyone else's turn, if that's the first spell they're casting that turn, it gets countered. It's important to note that with doubling season in play, you can obtain Jace's emblem the same turn he enters the battlefield. Jace the Mind Sculptor costs 2 generic and 2 blue to cast, has 4 abilities and a starting loyalty of 3, which is the only balanced aspect of this card. The Bane of Standard when it was legal, once banned for the longest time in Modern because of how busted he is, he's since been unbanned in Modern, garnering him his hefty $120 price tag. Keep in mind that when he was banned in Modern, the lowest price he had was about $60. It's safe to say that Jace is the most busted planeswalker ever printed. His plus two, not plus one, but plus two, can be used to either scry one for ourselves or scry one to an opponent against their will. His zero ability is a free brainstorm so that in and of itself is busted. His minus one is similar to the other Jace's minus two where it can be used to our benefit or to an opponent's detriment. His ultimate is one that might never happen but if an opponent has no hand and their graveyard is non-existent thanks to Ashok, then it's still a way to take an opponent out of the game. So even so, it's not completely useless. That being said, his first three abilities are the ones most utilized in the deck. Karn Liberated costs 7 generic mana to cast, has three abilities and a starting loyalty of 6, which isn't bad for his casting cost. His plus 4 ability can exile a card from an opponent's hand, and his minus 3 ability can exile any permanent in play. So basically Karn can practically permanently get rid of opponent's cards from the game. Not only that, but he gains a massive amount of loyalty with his first ability. His final ability can be backbreaking on a multiplayer commander game since those games usually already take a long time to complete. Imagine having to practically start over from scratch. That being said, his final ability is so far the only way to get rid of emblems as of the recording of this video. That might not be something we'd be keen on doing since we make emblems of our own. Kaya Ghost Assassin costs 2 generic, 1 white and 1 black, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 5 which is great for her casting cost. However, that's because she has no inherent way of increasing her loyalty counters. Technically. If she uses her first ability on herself, she'd enter the battlefield with 5 loyalty counters again after returning from exile, but on her own, she won't ever have more than 5. In that sense, Kaya is a pretty unique planeswalker to use. That being said, her ability is also pretty powerful. At the cost of 2 life, you can exile either Kaya or target creature until the beginning of your next upkeep. That means that you can continuously use Kaya to exile a problematic creature each of your turns, a creature that would probably never be able to attack you. You can also use it to protect one of your own creatures before casting a board wipe. You can also use it on a creature you control that has an enter the battlefield ability. Her minus one pings all opponents for two while also gaining us two life. When there are no threats on the board, this ability can be used as a slow drain since there are so many ways in the deck for proliferating. She could also easily do that every turn no problem. Her minus 2 ability is definitely a great disruption ability since it not only deprives each opponent of a card, you also get to draw a card. Liliana Vess, one of the original 5 Planeswalker cards before Mythic Rare Rarity existed, costs 3 generic and 2 black, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 5 counters which is good for her casting cost. Her plus 1 has the potential of disrupting an opponent, especially if they're holding answers against us. Her minus 2 ability is perhaps the best one since it's essentially an imperial seal on a body. However, if we only have one source of proliferating, we won't be able to use it every turn. That being said, when combined with ways of drawing cards in the same turn, her ability becomes a demonic tutor instead. 
Her ultimate isn't that hard to pull off, especially considering that she can ultimate the turn she enters play with doubling season on the battlefield. Since we're consistently wrathing the board or getting rid of creatures using our planeswalkers, achieving her ultimate would give us more creatures to both protect our walkers as well as attack our opponents. Keep in mind that this ability non bows with Ashok's minus one ability. So if you're going for that ultimate, don't activate Ashok. Narset Transcendent costs 2 generic, 1 white, and 1 blue, has 3 abilities, and a starting loyalty of 6, which is amazing for her casting cost. Although her plus 1 is not a straight up draw ability, it has a 47% chance of drawing us a card since there are 47 cards in the deck that are non-creature non-land. We have to reveal it in order to draw it, but I don't feel like that's such a drawback. Although the deck is only 13% comprised of instants and sorceries, her minus 2 ability is great when we do have such a card in our hand. If we use her ability with a tutor, we essentially use that tutor in 2 straight turns. The same is true for a ramp spell. Also, if we use that ability with a wrath, then opponents will be wary of playing any creatures their next turn because the wrath spell will occur again at the beginning of our next upkeep. That can buy us time and technically an additional turn without creatures on the board. All that being said, her ultimate is the main reason for her inclusion in the deck. Her emblem is incredibly oppressive and can shut down most decks on its own. Since opponents won't be able to play non-creature spells, that means that they won't be able to interrupt us with anything that isn't a creature. So unless they have creature based ramp or counter spells attached to a creature, we're going to be super well off. The deck has so many ways of dealing with creatures that once we have that emblem online, we have an exponentially easier route to victory. It's important to note that with doubling season in play, you can obtain Narset's emblem the same turn she enters the battlefield. Nissa Voice of Zendikar costs 1 generic and 2 green, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 3, which is good for her casting cost. Her plus 1 ability creates a 0-1 green plant creature token, which is great for defending her. Her minus 2 ability is just amazing in the deck because it's another way to place a plus 1 plus 1 counter on all of our creatures, similarly to a Johnny Steadfast. This provides something more to proliferate to our benefit. Her ultimate isn't too difficult to achieve, but it requires so many loyalty counters to activate that it's not something to do too often during a game. However, it is meant for the late game since activating it has us drawing a card for each land we control. As a bonus, we also gain the same amount of life too. Obnixilis Reignited costs 3 generic and 2 black, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 5 which is good for his casting cost. His plus 1 is just straight up draw at the cost of 1 life which is negligible in this deck. His minus 3 is a very important ability for this deck since it can destroy any creature. You have to spend 3 loyalty counters to use it so it is quite costly but with enough ways to consistently place loyalty counters on planeswalkers then you can almost consistently use that ability each turn until most of the more threatening creatures are taking out. His ultimate isn't that crucial to acquire. However, it's an emblem so it's almost impossible to get rid of. Unfortunately, it's given to a target opponent instead of each opponent, but with cards like Rings of Bright Hearth, you can duplicate the effect of the ability and either give two emblems to the same opponent or one emblem to two opponents. Also, if you're facing against an opponent that's drawing deep into their deck, this is definitely a way to put a stop to that, or at least make them think twice before drawing too many cards at once. Oko Thief of Crowns costs 1 generic, 1 green, and 1 blue to cast, has 3 abilities, and a starting loyalty of 4, which is great for his casting cost. His plus 2 ability creates a food token which isn't that good or even necessary in this deck since the Traxa alone can gain us at least 4 life each turn. However, when combined with his minus 5 ability, you can trade that food token for any creature with power 3 or less an opponent controls. This is great because you could potentially steal a Mana Dork or Hate Bear, which would make things much easier for us. In multiplayer EDH, most creatures in decks that have a power of 3 or less is because they're a utility creature. His plus 1 ability changes any creature into a 3-3 Green Elk, which is probably the most important ability for the deck. It could take out any creature, even indestructible, by making it a 3-3 with no abilities. The reason why that's so relevant for Atraxa is because she's a 4-4. So even if anyone hasn't entirely gotten rid of that opponent's creature, if it's still used to attack us, Atraxa can block it and survive, all while gaining us 4 life in the process. Unfortunately, Oko is currently around $50 due to Field of the Dead getting banned in standard. 
but if you have it or are considering it, then it's definitely worth a slot in a Super Friends deck that can run it. Tamiyo Field Researcher costs 1 generic, 1 green, 1 white, and 1 blue, has 3 abilities, and has a starting loyalty of 4, which is good for her casting cost. With its plus 1, you choose up to 2 target creatures. Until your next turn, whenever either of those creatures deal combat damage, you draw a card. What's good about this ability is that you don't have to choose your own creatures. You can choose opponent's creatures as well. So whenever those creatures deal combat damage, whether because they attacked or blocked, you draw a card for each one. Her minus 2 is another great ability in the deck since it freezes up to 2 target creatures. That can take 2 creatures out of combat for the next turn that might be dangerous towards us. She can also freeze creatures with top abilities so they can't activate their abilities as well as not being able to attack us. Her ultimate not only draws us 3 cards but gives us an epic emblem that grants us omniscience. Being able to cast non-land cards from our hands without paying their mana cost is pretty much a guaranteed victory. Definitely worth noting is that with doubling season in play, you can obtain Tamiyo's emblem the same turn she enters the battlefield. Tamiyo the Moon Sage costs 3 generic and 2 blue, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 4, which isn't bad for her casting cost. Her plus 1 freezes a permanent. When used on a creature, that prevents that creature from attacking our planeswalkers next turn. However, it can also be used as a way to tap down permanents with a tap ability in order to deprive our opponents from activating them until the untap step after their next one. Her minus 2 ability is a conditional draw but can be used quite effectively if an opponent has a lot of tap mana dorks or attackers. Maybe you played Tamiyo after a huge attack and can draw a ton of cards for just 5 mana. It's not the best way to draw cards but it does have the potential to draw a bunch of them. Her ultimate is just flat out amazing. Not only does her emblem give us a limitless hand size, but whenever a card would be put into our graveyard from anywhere, it goes right back to our hand. That means that it's worthless to counter our spells unless the counter is going to exile it. But it also means that whenever we cast a wrath spell, it'll just return to our hand afterwards. Also any creatures destroyed go to our hands instead of the graveyard. Same with planeswalkers. If we use up their loyalty, they just return to our hand. Combined with Tamiyo Field Researcher's Emblem, we can basically cast all our spells for free indefinitely. Also definitely worth noting is that with doubling season in play, you can obtain Tamiyo's Emblem the same turn she enters the battlefield. Teferi Hero of Dominaria costs 3 generic, 1 white and 1 blue, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 4 which isn't bad for his casting cost. His plus 1 is straight up card draw while also untapping 2 lands during our next end step. This is great for freeing up mana in case we have to activate Spike Weaver or need the mana to cast instants. His minus 3 tucks a non-land permanent which is a great way to get rid of something because it really sets back an opponent in tempo plus also gets around indestructible. That non-land permanent doesn't have to be a creature either, it could be an annoying artifact, enchantment or maybe another planeswalker. His emblem is pretty brutal but it's not the point of the deck. That being said, when achieved, every time we draw a card, we're able to exile an opponent's permanent. With all the planeswalkers that can draw us cards, that can add up. Just like most other planeswalkers with emblems in this deck, his ultimate is achievable when he enters the battlefield if we control doubling season. Teferi Temporal Archmage costs 4 generic and 2 blue, has 3 abilities we can use, and a starting loyalty of 5, which isn't bad for his casting cost. His plus one lets us filter the top two cards to put one card in our hand and the other on the bottom of the deck. Since we're not technically drawing a card, this won't trigger effects that care about us drawing cards and it also bypasses any effects that prohibit us from drawing a card. His minus one provides some serious advantage especially when used with artifacts like Mana Crypt and the Chain Bale. When combined with Tesseret the Seeker, you can achieve infinite activations of the Chain Bale which in turn provide infinite Planeswalker ability activations. Let's just quickly see how this works. I already explained this interaction in my Primacon Sky Rampart tech deck where I also use Primacon as the commander of a Super Friends deck. Let's just quickly take a look at that section of the video. You need Teferi Temporal Archmage, Tesseret the Seeker and a Mana Rock that gives a lot of mana like Gilded Lotus, Coveted Jewel or Mana Vault. It's important to note that there are various ways of having this situation in play. Whether you use Tesseret with 5 loyalty counters to tutor for the Chain Bale or you hard cast it into play. It could also be that you already used their loyalty abilities but are now able to activate the Chain Bale to use them again. 
The point is that whatever be the case, I'm going to show a general method to achieve infinite planeswalker activations with these cards. Let's assume that you've already used Teferi and Tesserit, but have just activated the Chain Veil. You can now use them all over again. Plus one Tesseret to untap the Chain Veil and Gilded Lotus. Tap Gilded Lotus to add three mana of any color to your mana pool. Minus one Teferi to untap Gilded Lotus and three lands. Tap those lands and Gilded Lotus to now have six more mana in your mana pool for a total of nine. Use four of that mana to activate the Chain Veil. You can now use their abilities again. Plus one Tesseret to untap the Chain Veil and Gilded Lotus. Plus one to Fairy, so he'd have a net loyalty counter change of zero. Tap Gilded Lotus to add three more mana to your mana pool for a total of eight. Use four mana in the mana pool to activate the Chain Veil. You're now back at the beginning of this example with a net gain of four mana. This generates infinite mana and infinite place one. Granted, that video was considering the color identity of Primacon and thus the Planeswalkers available for that deck, but in this deck it still rings true. If you're interested in that Super Friends build, you can find a link for it at the top right corner of this video as well as in the description down below. You can use that combination to generate infinite activations of the Chain Veil and thus infinite Planeswalker activations. And even if you don't have Tesseret the Seeker in play, you can still use Teferi's minus one in order to untap four lands at the very least. His ultimate provides us with one of the best emblems for a Super Friends deck. It reads, you may activate loyalty abilities of Planeswalkers you control on any player's turn anytime you could cast an instant. This means that all those abilities we've seen so far and those yet to come could be used during an opponent's turn. So you can use those freeze, bounce, tuck, exile, destroy, etc. abilities during an opponent's turn to really help protect your planeswalkers from their creatures. You could also use it to draw cards during each turn, etc. Oh, and of course, the cherry on top is that you can obtain this emblem the moment Teferi enters the battlefield if you have doubling season in play. Tesseret the Seeker costs 3 generic and 2 blue, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 4, which isn't bad for his casting cost. His plus one allows us to untap up to two artifacts which, as I just mentioned earlier, can go infinite with Teferi Temporal Archmage. However, it can also be used to untap Mana Crypt and Honor Worn Shaku. You could also use it to untap other players' Mana Rocks if you want to try and be political. That's just how diverse and multi-use his ability can be. His second ability allows us to tinker for any artifact with converted mana cost X, where X is the amount of loyalty counters we remove from Tesseret when we activate it. That means that we can tutor for Mana Crypt for free, but it also means that we can tutor for Rings of Brighthearth and the Chain Veil. However, caution must be used when tinkering for the Chain Veil, since it would require 4 loyalty counters. If you use it the same turn you bring Tesseret in play, you may have to sacrifice him as a state-based action. These two abilities are pretty much the sole reason for his inclusion in the deck since his ultimate isn't really used. The deck only has 5 artifacts and there isn't really anything to be gained by converting them into 5-5 five, five creatures until end of turn. That being said, Tesseret is in no way a bad or subpar planeswalker in the deck. Tesseret Artifice Master costs 3 generic and 2 blue, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 5 which is good for his casting cost. His plus one creates a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter token with flying, which is great to protect itself. His second ability straight up draws us a card for no change in loyalty. As a bonus, if we control three or more artifacts, then we can draw two cards instead. Being as he creates artifacts, this bonus could be very easily achieved. His ultimate grants us an emblem that reads, At the beginning of your end step, search your library for a permanent card. Put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. This might seem unsynergistic with a Super Friends deck because we won't be able to use a Planeswalker's ability at the end of the turn. It has to be during any of our main phases. However, that doesn't mean that we can't use it to cheat doubling season into play or dueling grounds. We could also use it to get lands out of the deck or key creatures like Spike Weaver. It's still a good emblem to achieve if you play around it. And if you reach a point where you have a solid control of the table, you could use it to cheat Planeswalkers into play. Did I mention that you can obtain this emblem the moment Tesseret enters the battlefield if you have doubling season in play? Well, you can. 
The Wanderer costs 3 generic and 1 white, has super abilities and a starting loyalty of 5, which is good, but considering that she has no inherent way of increasing loyalty, then it might not seem so good after all. However, she has a solid static ability that prevents all non-combat damage that would be dealt to us and other permanents we control. That means that our planeswalkers are safe against burn and spells like Magma Quake. Her minus 2 straight up exiles a creature with power 4 or greater, which is amazing since those are the kinds of creatures I don't want Atraxa blocking since it'd be a 1 for 1 trade. Although the ability requires 2 loyalty counters, it's not without reason that the deck might consistently proliferate or place between 1 to 2 loyalty counters on our planeswalkers each turn. That means that the Wanderer might have more than enough loyalty counters on her to deal with big threats. Venser the Shazjourner costs 3 generic, 1 white and 1 blue, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 3, which isn't good unfortunately considering his casting cost. His plus 2 exiles a permanent we own, not simply a permanent we control, and then it returns to the battlefield under our control at the beginning of the next end step. That means that not only can we use this to delay flicker any of our permanents, which as you can tell by now provides mad advantage, but we can also use it to recover any stolen permanent. His minus 1 makes all creatures unblockable until end of turn. That might seem like an odd ability to use in a super friends deck when our creatures are meant to be used as blockers, but making Atraxa unblockable could be quite useful if we want to guarantee her getting through for combat damage whether to rack up commander damage or because she has sort of truth and justice equipped and wants to trigger it. His ultimate is pretty devastating emblem, which allows us to exile any permanent whenever we cast a spell. That transforms any one of our spells into the ultimate removal spell. Unfortunately, it's not achievable the same turn you have Venster enter the battlefield with doubling season, unless you also have some other way to increase his loyalty before activating him. Braska the Unseen costs 3 generic, 1 black and 1 green, has 3 activated abilities and a starting loyalty of 5, which is good for her casting cost. Braska might seem like an odd choice to include since she doesn't seem so overpowered at first, especially when I have 133 planeswalkers currently to choose from. Well, that's because her abilities are very relevant here. With her plus 1, any creature that deals combat damage to her gets destroyed, and there will come a point where creatures will want to try and attack her because her ultimate provides an alternate win con. That's because she creates 3 1 1 black assassin creature tokens that kill a player whenever they deal combat damage to them. They're basically mini phage the untouchable. Her minus 3 ability is also incredibly relevant since it destroys any non land permanent. That means she can get rid of creatures as well as any annoying artifact, enchantment, or planeswalker. What's crazy about Braska is that she can ultimate the same turn you put her onto the battlefield if you also have doubling season in play. But. If you have doubling season in play, then you create 6 mini phages instead. If you also happen to have Venser in play when you declare attack, then they're unblockable and you just eliminated every player from the game. Braska Relic Seeker costs 4 generic, 1 black, 1 green, has 3 abilities and a starting loyalty of 6 which is good for her casting cost. Her plus 2 creates a 2-2 black pirate token which can be used to protect her. Her minus 2 destroys an artifact, creature, or enchantment and then creates a treasure token. Although the treasure token is a great bonus, being able to destroy such a permanent is very useful in a deck that doesn't want opponents having creatures that can attack us. Her ultimate is crazy since it makes any player's life become 1. That is great when someone at the table gained infinite life because then you brought them back down to size. But What's good about eventually pulling off the ultimate is that even a lowly token breaking through can kill that player. So it's also a great way to close off a game. In that sense, both Vraskas included in the deck play similar roles. Last but not least, Wolf Kenrith costs 4 generic and 2 blue, has 3 useful abilities and a starting loyalty of 4 which isn't good considering his mana cost. Although he's partnered with Rowan Kenrith, we can't take advantage of that since the deck can't run her. However, we can make good use of his other abilities. His plus 1 can make up to 2 creatures become 0-3 without abilities until our next turn. That means that they won't be a threat to us and if they're indestructible, can be destroyed. So it's a great way to protect our planeswalkers from huge threats. His minus 2 can have us draw 2 cards. Not only that, but it also lets us cast any instant, sorcery or planeswalker for 2 generic less until our next turn. In a deck like this, this ability is amazing since it eases casting multiple planeswalkers in a single turn. 
It also makes our board wipes easier to cast since it helps reduce its cost. His ultimate is an emblem that isn't used that often in the deck. It has, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. Obviously, if we have this emblem and cast a tutor or ramp spell, we're golden. But that's pretty much all it's good for. That being said, if we're playing two-headed giant, we can give this to our partner and really take their game to the next level. Bonus points if our partner is running Rowan Kenrith in their deck. All in all, these planeswalkers are used for creating tokens, generating mana, creating card advantage, disrupting our opponents, getting rid of threats, as well as granting us game-breaking emblems. The rest of the cards in the deck are lands, all 11 fetch lands, all 6 dual lands, all 6 shock lands, city of brass, command tower, mana confluence, and murmuring bosk. Gemstone mine is included because its counters can get proliferated, and interplanar beacon is included because it can give us any mana to cast planeswalkers. Having as many lands that can give us as much mana as possible without entering the battlefield tapped is critical in making this deck not stall. The deck also includes one of each basic land in case anyone plays Blood Moon or casts Path to Exile or Assassin's Trophy. I know the mana base is extremely expensive, but either way, Super Friends decks tend to be expensive. That being said, I could very easily swap out all of the very expensive lands for suitable substitutes and still make the deck work. So if that's where you more or less stand, I think it's still pretty doable. This brew is just how I built a Traxa Praetor's Voice at the helm of a Nano Red Super Friends deck. As I mentioned earlier, there are just so many ways to build around a Traxa, which is probably why she's number one on EDH rec. Even when building a Super Friends deck, there's just so many ways to go about it since there are 133 planeswalkers in this color identity that are legal in Commander as of the recording of this video. If you're interested in the deck list of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all of my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for their patronage. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am Demented Kirby and happy brewing.